What's up? What's up? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all. I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, I want to make one little announcement. If you all are interested in uh, reforming the choir, if you are uh, wanting to come sing on, um, you know, Sundays and Wednesday nights and those sorts of things, let me know. We're trying to see if we can get enough interest generated, and if we can, we'll we'll start choir back hopefully in February. Um, Anyway, so just let me know if you can uh, as soon as you feel led. Um, anyway, there is an insert in your bulletin if you'd like to take it out. You're welcome to. We're going to start out today by singing, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let's stand together.
Good morning. It's a beautiful Sunday morning to be in the Lord's house. Uh, I have just a, a few announcements. Uh, you can also find these announcements in your bulletin. Uh, starting tonight, we will have church tonight at 6 p.m. here at the church. Uh, we are going through the Gospel of Mark. And we just come through and talked about uh, the first coming, uh, uh, the Advent of Christ. We celebrated Advent. We celebrated Christmas. And in that, we talked about the first coming of Christ. Tonight, we're going to look at Mark's gospel in the second coming and what the gospel of Mark, what Mark has to say about Jesus returning in the future to come. So I'd encourage everyone to come out tonight again at 6 p.m. for our Sunday night service. In your bulletin, uh, you'll notice that uh, on the 13th and the 27th is a prayer group. That's a Thursday night at 630 and that is just a time for the church to come together and pray for our church, how we can grow and how we can move forward in the new year. Also, you'll notice that it has a 23rd is the business meeting. Uh, we were having the business meetings on the third Sundays of the month. So technically, I believe that would be next Sunday, the 16th. Uh, if I am wrong, I will let everybody know. But business meetings should be next Sunday, uh, the 16th, right after the morning service. Coming up on January the 28th. The XYZers are going to meet at uh, Smithfield Barbecue. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the educational hallway back here. <clears throat> so if you'd like to sign up for that, again, that is the 28th of January. The XYZers will be going to Smithfield Barbecue. And then on February 14th, the singles and Sunday school class will eat at Brady's in Wallace, South Carolina. That is at 6.30 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the uh, back hallway as well and also in Jim's Sunday school class. So if you would like to participate in that, you can sign up for that. And again, it is just such a wonderful time to be in the Lord's house. I'm grateful that we're able to gather here in our sanctuary. So at this time, let us greet one another in the name of the Lord.
singing. Hey, you mean brother, brother, brother? Um, I want to announce we're having a deacons meeting immediately after service. Uh, about ten minutes of your time, if you could meet and uh, go over a couple things. Um, I have the prayer list that uh, was turned in this morning during Sunday school hour. Um, Ashley from California, uh, our nation, our leaders, David Bowers, Addie has COVID. I'm not sure who added my last name. J.C. Russell, Maddie Edmonds, Riley Russell, Jean McNair, Shirley Smith, Ernestine Coker, Barbara Brown, Jeanette Killian, Christy Ward and family, and Virginia Duffy and family. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us day in and day out. Lord, I just ask that you be with all of us here this morning. Keep us safe and just continue to guide us, Lord, and be with those that couldn't be here this morning. Lord, as we lift these names up to you this morning, we know that you know exactly what's going on in their, in their worlds, Lord, in their lives. We just ask that you touch them, Lord. Maybe they're, they're sick. Maybe uh, they got some financial situations. Maybe they have COVID or so many things going on in the world today. The loss of a loved one. We just ask that you be with them, Lord, and give them comfort. And just give them those that love like nobody can give and that comfort that no one else can give, Lord. Just ask that you continue to be with us each and every way. And Lord, this time we'd also like to ask that you bless our offering. Uh, use it to um, grow your kingdom in the way that you see fit. And we ask all this in Jesus' name.
children would come on down here to the front for Kingdom Kids this morning. We haven't done this in a while. Got one, two, you. That's good. Sit right down here for me. Okay. All right. Well, good morning. How are you two? Good. Well, this morning we're going to talk about worth. Do you know what that word means? To be worth something? How much it costs okay that's a good that's a good uh example of that so i want to know something how much do you think this is worth fifty dollars that's right you know this fifty dollars was created to be a fifty dollar bill right but did you know that i accidentally left it in my pocket and it went through the washing machine it sure did did you know that the person before me might have dropped it in a big nasty bundy puddle or it got stepped on, or maybe even, maybe even it was used for something that wasn't godly. Yeah, maybe someone used this money to buy something that wasn't for the Lord. Mm, yeah, that's a good example. So this $50, it's been through a lot of things, hasn't it? Made some uh, adventures in places that probably it shouldn't have gone. But how much is it still worth? $50, that's right. You know, God created us in his image, and he created us to be children of his. And when we are saved into his family, we get to be worth exactly what he says we are worth. And he says we are worthy and that we are his children. And in the Bible, in Psalms 139, 14, it says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. So no matter what we go through in our lives, no matter what kind of decisions we make, no matter um, what poor decisions we make, no matter how many different trials and hard times and things that just don't feel good happen, our worth is exactly what God created us to be. And it doesn't matter who tells us otherwise. It doesn't matter if our school friends tell us that we're not worthy to do things or that we're not smart enough. It doesn't matter if the world and the media tells us that we're not good enough to do this or do that. Our worth is not based on what they think. Our worth is based on what God created us to be. And he says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's pray before we go to Children's Church this morning. Father God, we just thank you so much for the time that you invested in us, that you have told us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that no matter where we've been in our lives and what we've been through, no matter how many muddy puddles we've fallen into, Lord, that you are still on the throne. And you say that we are a child of the King if we have accepted you to be our Father. And we thank you and praise you for that. Let these children be light in this dark, dark world this week. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You're dismissed to Children's Church.
you will turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and we will begin in verse 1. I learned this morning that if uh, my wife's going to leave $50 bills in the wash and dryer, I need to do the laundry more often. <laughs> Amen to that. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. My question for you this morning is this. Do you remember your first encounter of Christ? Do you remember your first encounter with Christ or of Christ or of hearing of Christ? Maybe even experiencing the feeling of the Holy Spirit as Christ come to dwell with you? I remember when I was 12 years old, and I remember sitting on my sister's bed and them leading me through the gospel and telling me that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And I remember them telling me that Jesus had come, had lived, had died and risen again, and that he died for me. And I remember accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, I knew exactly what it meant to be lost. Uh, I knew exactly what it meant to not know what the future holds. Uh, some of us in uh, the philosophical realm, some people call that uh, existential crisis. Uh, it's a feeling of hope, of lostness, of not knowing. And I remember those that night, I remember those days, I remember not knowing what it was until I heard my sister go through the gospel and tell me what it meant to know Jesus Christ. But I remember even more clearly the emotional, uh, I don't want to say uh, emotional and physical, but the emotional experience that I felt when I was called to preach at the age of 15. I remember where I was at. I was at Ridgecrest. I remember I was at a youth conference. And I remember someone saying the scripture, Ephesians 4.11, and he called some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. And at that moment... I experienced Christ, not for the first time, but more alive in my life than I could ever imagine. I remember being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we call that the God bumps where you get goosebumps all over you. That's what we call it in our household. I remember feeling that. I remember the emotion that had come over me. I remember as if almost I had seen Christ face to face, and I knew what I was called to do in my life. I knew that I was called to be in ministry. I was not the same after that. Now, when I, uh, when I uh, made my profession of faith, you know, I was 12 years old. I don't know if I was a really bad 12-year-old and then became an even better 12-year-old. I don't know. But I remember being at 15 how my life changed. I remember how conflicted I was over things that I had done and things that I knew I was going to do as a young teenager and even as a teenager. I remember struggling from the age of 15 to 19 until I took serious that that was what God had wanted me to do. I never found peace in doing anything else. I never found peace in being an electrician. There's nothing wrong with that. I never found peace in doing uh, skilled labor, though there's nothing wrong with that. I had a passion for it, but I never had a peace not like I did when the peace of Christ came over me when I said, Lord, I surrender my life to go to college and to be in ministry. I was not the same. I was changed. Paul talks about this in uh, Corinthians and how the old man is not the same and how we become a new man when we encounter Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9 leads us into the very conversion of Saul. And that's what I want to take a look at uh, this morning in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, the conversion of Saul. Uh, if you remember, as we had started last year in the, the new year, we started going through the book of Acts. We titled this uh, series, Troubling Times and uh, Trying Times. And as we uh, are going through trying times, not only in 2021 and also carrying into 2022, the early church went through trying times just as we have. Their trying times may even be more dramatic and more drastic than ours are. But no doubt, there is no doubt in my mind that we are going through trying times now in our church period. And as we get into Acts chapter 9, I want to take a look at a pinnacle, a turning point 
something that is absolutely desired and needed in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 beginning in Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. I want to look at first of all the problem that is in Saul's life, the problem of Saul's life. But still Saul still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and he asked for them letters of the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now we have been introduced to the character of Saul, not in this set of scriptures, but in a few scriptures back. If you go back into Acts chapter 8, picking up in verse 1, uh, you see that uh, Saul approved his execution. And in there in those days arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions. Except for the apostles and devout men buried Stephen. And if you remember at the stoning of Stephen who was the first martyr. That Paul or as we call him now Saul was instrumental in seeing the death of Stephen. All of those who agreed upon came and laid their coats at the feet of Saul as he was the one who instigated and had Stephen killed. But Saul was still ravishing the church in that time and entering house after house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. But Saul still breathing those same threats a whole chapter later after the apostles have went and have told others about Jesus Fearlessly not worrying of what is to come. We pick up with Saul still murdering, still arresting. And so much so that he is against the disciples and against this risen Christ. That he goes to the high priest and he asks him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. He is asking for international papers, traveling papers that give him the authority of the church to go and to arrest not only men, but women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem to be executed. There's a problem in Saul's life. Paul is filled with hatred. You don't read the words that Luke writes and take them lightly, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. We read in, the, in chapter 7 and in, in Acts chapter 8 of how he took an innocent man and had him stoned to death. This is one of the probably most brutal ways that someone could experience death in this time period. Paul is filled with hatred. He is filled with pain. He is what we call damaged. But Saul is pre-Christ. How many of you can relate to how Paul may feel? How many of you know what it was like before you met Jesus? Now, some of you may have accepted Jesus at a young age. I was 12 years old. My, my daughters were even younger when they made professions of faith. But some of you may have accepted Jesus in your 20s, your 30s, 40s. 50s, maybe even in your 60s. I've seen uh, encounters with people who have lived their whole lives sitting in the pews of the church, coming to church, not having a genuine relationship with God. And sometimes these people are filled with hatred and anger and rage. You may have somebody in your family who may feel this way. The problem was Saul is that he does not know who Jesus is. He knows of Jesus. He knows that he hates Jesus. It's very interesting if you begin to line up the time period, if you begin to read and you look, when Jesus was going through the synagogues and he was preaching his earthly ministry, Saul was a young boy who was training. And from the beginning in Saul's very young age, as he began his training in the synagogue, he was taught that Jesus was the enemy, that this man threatens the way of life. This man performs miracles, but is not God himself. And he was taught to hate instead of love. 
He was taught to segregate instead of accept. He was taught hatred and pain. There's a problem in Saul's life. But we also get to see the power of Saul's God. As he is headed to Damascus and he is going to arrest those, verse 3 tells us that now as he went on his way, as he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? Lord, and he that is the risen Christ said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's very interesting the words that Paul uh, tells here as Luke continues to write this. This isn't a casual encounter. This isn't going to a Walmart and running into someone and saying, hey, how are you? And then you carry on about your day. This is a life altering experience. This is something that Paul will remember throughout the rest of his life and write in his books. This encounter was something, nothing short of a miracle. And as he was going on his way, a light of heaven shone. A light so bright that it probably brought him to his knees. I don't know about you, but I have accidentally flashed myself in the face with a high-powered flashlight. And everything goes completely blank. You can't see anything. Your eyes are disoriented. You see colors that you're not supposed to and you cannot focus. I can only imagine as Saul saw this light that it absolutely caused him to fall to the ground. And he heard a voice and that voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not why are you persecuting the church? Not why are you persecuting Christians? Not why are you persecuting men and women, but why are you persecuting me? The words here echo that we are belong to the kingdom of God. And those who truly accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior now belong to the kingdom, now belong to the family of God. And if you were to persecute one, you were to persecute all of them. And if you persecute them, it is of almost you are persecuting Christ. Paul says, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Could this be? Could this be the man that I have persecuted? Could this be the man that we hung on the cross? I have no doubt in my mind that Saul knows exactly what Jesus looked like. I have no doubt in my mind that Paul remembers exactly what Jesus looked like. And he sees this figure, and though it is transformed, and though it is surrounded in light, I guarantee you when he sees the face, he understands that this is the man we killed. This is Jesus Christ. This is the one that we call God incarnate. This is Emmanuel. This is God and the only words that come out of who are you Lord and he said I am Jesus whom you are persecuting those are the words that Jesus cuts to the heart of Saul I am Jesus echoing the words I am who I am the words that were mentioned back in the Old Testament at the burning bush Moses Sees the burning bush and hears, I am who I am. But Saul sees the living Savior and a flash of light greater than the fire. And hears the words, I am who I am. I am whom you are persecuting. But he doesn't stop there. Instead of condemning Saul, instead of taking the life of Saul, Instead of taking the soul of Saul, he gives him instructions. He tells him, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Now Paul, or as Saul as we call him, is given a words of what to do. 
But the men who were traveling with him, they stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Paul traveled with an entourage, just as the high priest would from the synagogue. And as he is traveling, the men who were there, they hear this voice, but they do not recognize who it is. They see no one. They see nothing. But they hear the voice just as Saul has. And this is the power of Saul's God. He appears before Saul and he tells him who he is and he gives him instructions. Nothing further, nothing less, but nothing more. I am who I am. You are persecuting me. But now rise, enter the city, and you will be told what to do from there. And the men who were there were astonished as they heard the audible voice of God. That is the power that we see that God has given. Now, I have experienced God firsthand. I have experienced the emotions. I've never seen the risen Savior, but the New Testament and Paul in Hebrews, I believe, as he wrote, tells us that blessed are those who believe and have not seen. But I can tell you, though, that I have never seen the risen Christ, not until I cross from this life to the next, that I have certainly experienced the Holy Spirit. I have been filled by the Holy Spirit. I have experienced the love of Christ. I have experienced the grace of Christ. I have experienced the mercy of Christ. I have experienced the forgiveness of God. I have seen the wrath of God. I have seen the judgment of God. But I have experienced the forgiveness of God. That is the power that we see here. And lastly, we see the product of Saul's encounter. We see the problem of his life and the power of his God. And now we see the outcome, the product of his encounter. Saul rose from the ground. And although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. Saul, for the moment, was struck blind. Now, I, I, I read this and I think, well... Of course he was. He saw the glory of God firsthand. He saw the glory of God in the flesh. It makes me think, I'm surprised that he wasn't struck dead. I'm surprised that he didn't melt like that person off of the Indiana Jones movie. I'm surprised that God did not take his soul just like that. But why didn't he? Because Saul experienced the forgiveness of God. Yet he rose from the ground and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. He had been stricken blind for the moment. So they led him by his hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight. But not only was he without sight, he neither ate nor drank. Now this is where we end our sermon. Next week we pick up with a disciple of Christ and we carry on this story. But as Paul is lying in the bed for three days, he saw nothing, he ate nothing, and he drank nothing. This is the power that we see in the encounter of God. He doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He fasts. And I wonder if while he is in this state, he ponders what the Lord has in store for him. I would almost guarantee you he looks back on his life and he thinks, what have I done wrong? Why have I followed the rules of man? And not the law of God. Why did I listen to those who told me to persecute and to kill. Instead of to focus on God. And the one that they call Jesus. In conclusion I want you to understand this. That our lives should be drastically changed. Our lives should be dramatically changed. If you look at your life right now in this moment, and it does not matter how old you are. It does not matter 
how old you are, but if you look at your life right now, I want you to ask yourself, is my life better or worse than it was yesterday? Now, I'm not talking about being sick. I'm not talking about being, you know, not feeling well. I'm talking about your relationship with Jesus Christ right now at this moment. Now, it's easier for you to say, yeah, it's great. It's Sunday. I'm here in church. I'm hearing the preacher preach. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. But what about tomorrow? Will your tomorrow and your relationship with God be better than your relationship with God today? <coughs> Stop and ask yourself... Are you a professional Christian? I come Sunday morning. I come Sunday night. I come Wednesday night. I participate in the things we do. But outside of that, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Do you pray every day of the week? Do you read your Bible every day of the week? We should see a drastic change in our lives from when we first met Christ until we see Christ now. We should be drastically changed in the way that God has moved in our life from the day yesterday until today. Our relationship should be stronger. Our prayer life should be better. Our gospel reading should be more. Has God changed you? And can you see the difference? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, for your grace and for your mercy. And Father, we thank you that we have, can say, if we, if we know for a fact, we can say thank you for the encounter that we've had of Christ. I cannot speak for anyone in this room but for myself, and I can say thank you for my encounter with Christ, the day that he saved me from my sins, and the day you called me to preach the gospel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I pray for everyone who hears this message, whether it is here on a Sunday morning or will hear it on a recording or see it online. And my prayer is that their life will be changed with an encounter with you. I pray that you begin to move in their hearts and their minds. I pray, Father, if they have sin that is hidden, that you will give them the strength to confess that sin and to confront it. I pray, Father, if they have worries, doubts, or fears, that they would lay them in your hands. And that you would lead, you would guide, and that we would trust in you. After it is all said and done, when we cross in from this life to the next, and we see the risen Savior face to face, then what we can say is thank you. Father, until that day, I pray that you would lead us, you would guide us, and you would direct us for your honor and for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand with me as we have our hymn of invitation? The altars are open. And if you need to come forward and you need to lay bare your soul to God, now is the time to do it. If you are missing something, now is the time to come and find it. If you need to change your life, now is the time to do so. Number 382. <laughs>
bow, or should we close this in prayer?